So this is the last presentation, also the most important presentation, of course, and uh, possibly the least technical presentation of today, which is, of course, a pleasure. Uh, my name is Marcin Kaminski. I'm CEDA's Policy Specialist on Freedom of Expression and ICT. Uh, CEDA is, for those of you who are not Swedish, the Swedish Governmental Agency for Development Cooperation and Aid. Uh, we are governed by uh, governmental strategies, pinpointing what we should do, and uh, then we are supposed to implement those strategies in something that we call the how, how to do it. My point for presenting here today is partially to make you aware of the fact how CEDA is working with ICT issues, technology, technology issues, but also to pinpoint some of the key challenges that, that we see from our horizon, uh, which could also possibly include people like you working in technology. So CEDA has a long history of working with ICT, uh, we have been working on, on these issues for 15 or 20 years, mostly in terms of uh, funding infrastructure projects in development countries. Uh, developing countries, sorry. Uh, but since a couple of years, we're also very heavily involved in uh, ICT for the issues, but ICT not for, only for development, but also for democracy. And one keystone of that is the United Nations resolution that was adopted a couple of years ago, which clearly states that the UN affirms that the same rights that people have offline must must also be protected online, meaning that all the human rights initiatives that we are dealing with are supposed to be covered both online and uh, offline and online. This uh, this uh, suddenly makes internet, of course, an interesting field for human rights meaning that we should be involved in this in a very practical sense. See this, as I said, governed by strategies from, from the government, and we have a couple of strategies that are specifically interesting for us working in ICT issues in developing cooperation, but also for people like you that are dealing with heavily uh, technical issues that could be or should be related to uh, develop development issues in other countries. One of those, sorry for the Swedish, but one of those is the strategy for global, uh, global economic and uh, environmental sustainability, uh, which has a clear focus on ICT issues. And the key phrase in this, in this slide is that Sweden is, through CEDA, supposed to act for increased accessibility and usage of open, secure and free internet information and communications technologies, ICTs. This gives us a quite clear mandate on working on, for instance, resilient infrastructure. It means that we should be able to disperse or distribute internet access to the poorest of the poor, the most unfree of the unfree, to every people, every person in developing countries that is not yet connected. We're also supposed to uh, work with strengthening the, the access for people in developing countries to global discussions on internet issues, this is the last bullet point, meaning that we are supposed to work more closely with forums like the IGF, uh, the VISIS uh, discussions, but also the Stockholm Internet Forum, which we have arranged here in Sweden for a couple of years now, meaning that we are supposed to bring people from developing countries that might not be able to, on their own, involve, be involved in these discussions and make them their voices heard and their presence have been guaranteed in the uh, discussions that are taking place on a, a global on a global arena. Yet another discussion uh, strategy that is interesting is the democracy and human rights strategy that CEDA is working with, where there is a clear focus on the access or increased access and increased possibilities or availability for individuals, organizations, and society organizations to. Uh, to use internet and informa information and communications technology for democracy. And this is something that is highly interesting, uh, especially as CEDA is working in some of the most unfree countries of the world. And this is especially interesting now, when we have something that is uh, been de dealt with on a global uh, scale called the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, of which you might have heard, the Global Goals for Sustainable Development where there are a couple of paragraphs that could uh, or possibly should involve uh, internet actors, technology actors and ICTs. 
And some of these are mentioned here. For instance, there, we as global actors should ensure public access to information, meaning that we should work on freedom of expression and ICT. And we should also protect fundamental freedoms, which is super interesting uh, in relation to the human rights, uh, for, sorry, for the, to the UN uh, resolution on human rights uh, online, offline and off online. We should also empower and promote the social, uh, economic and political inclusion of all, meaning that all people should be able to take part in societal contexts as much as the other one. Uh, which in terms of a digital global community obviously means that as many people as possible should be connected to something that could call the, be called the internet. Uh, we should also ensure equal opportunities and reduce inequalities, meaning that we should continue working on human rights. And the last and possibly the most obvious paragraph is that we should increase access to information and communications technologies. This, this, uh, uh, global, these global goals on, for sustainable development is something that is, uh, has been dealt, being dealt with on a global level but is also concluded with consensus that all countries of the world should uh, live up to the, what is stated in the global goals, including Sweden uh, and also in developing countries. And by leaving this resolution on the screen, I would like to take a minute to explain some of the challenges that we see currently in the field of human rights and internet. Some of those include parts of your operations, possibly, and could also give you a brief introduction to the challenges that we see. For instance, there is something called the CISA, which is the Committee for, of Intelligent and Security Services of Africa. This is a pan-African uh, collaboration between countries and actors all over the African, African continent. And for, a recent, uh, for several years now, recently, they have held workshops aiming to establish a pan-African cyber security agenda. In the, this agenda, which is currently a draft framework, they have, of course, focused on cyber crime and cyber terrorism. And some of the wordings that they are using in terms of uh, fulfilling this agenda is that they are supposed to use governments, international institutions and also companies to create security awareness and strengthen national, cultural, religious, ethical and ideological values. Uh, this obviously don't need, needs to, it doesn't need to mean that much, but one of the uh, provisions that they are allowing their, uh, their members to use is for instance to encourage all internet service providers, which includes your customers, I suppose, uh, to use governmentally issued certificates for effective monitoring of their customers. This is, of course, what, what we would call a man in the middle of attack of all internet users in this context, which in, in a pan-African context is a lot of people. Uh, this is used as a there are worries, worries within the civil society organizations dealing with internet matters in the African continent, on the African continent. Of course, due to the fact of surveillance issues, but also that there's a risk of these activities not to stifle crim uh, crime, criminal activities, but possibly even to encourage criminal activities, as it would be more difficult for the ordinary user or civil society organizations to actually use the free flow of information or access of information to, for instance, expose corruption or a criminal intent. Also, we see a lot of uh, issues in many African countries, especially African countries, but also others, uh, to establish some kind of cyber crime acts. They are uh, being dealt with in different ways, but they are more or less uh, similar. For instance, there, there is one uh, cyber crime act in Kenya, which is also part of the media bill or media act in, in Kenya, which uh, writes that it's, uh, it, it is illegal for uh, social media users or citizens to disperse information that could instigate public unrest, meaning that it's not, no longer possible, according to law at least, to report on issues that could be sensitive politically or socially. There's also uh, 
uh, a cybercrime act in Tanzania, which allows the government to uh, collect, basically, equipment, technical equipment for, from human rights defenders or civil society organizations that are uh, being uh, treated as they would, uh, um, that they, they could, there could be a suspicion of them dispersing false information meaning that if they are reporting on an issue that is sensitive and the government does not uh, think that that's correct, they could actually be, uh, the, the equipment of those organizations or individuals could be confiscated with no warrants at all, and uh, meaning that there, there is currently a lot of technical equipment uh, that is belonging to suicide organizations monitoring elections, uh, and there is no motivation on uh, why this has happened at all. Also recently, in terms of election times in Uganda, there was a big internet shutdown, of, especially of social media, but also SMS services, uh, that was clearly related to elect electoral monitoring. So the parts of Uganda where there were civil society organizations uh, monitoring elections through the use of SMS services or different kinds of uh, online platforms, uh, suddenly the services were disconnected. Uh, due to government orders on the local telcos. So this is something that we are also looking into. Um, and just a few days ago I got reports from Myanmar where uh, an independent media body uh, discovered that the, the networks, their networks were infected with uh, Trojans that when traced back by uh, for, IT forensics uh, originated in something that could be a military complex in the, uh, in the capital of Myanmar, in uh, Yangon. And this is something that we are looking into, of course, and where our partners are really active, as we have a lot of partners working on digital safety and security issues. Uh, but something that is be becoming more and more clear is that these issues that typically have been human rights issues are now, now getting more and more uh, in, involved in also technologies, especially when we have large uh, uh, global part actors on the tech scene that are in many of our countries, and we are eagerly to trying to have more and more dialogue, both directly between Sweden and uh, the actors, of course, but also between our partners and uh, actors. Maybe I'll stop there for a minute, Murani, if possible. Open for questions, possibly. After this hasty run through of human rights online. Okay, shoes. We've got uh, we've got fifteen minutes, and I think uh, I think Marcin is someone who likes to take questions. So you're quite interactive, and you know your topics well. So um, any questions? Come on, yeah. Why not? <coughs> Well, there is one obvious perpetrator, Russia. Any suggestions? I mean, there is no democracy, no freedom on the internet. Can we do something? I think that that's uh, an interesting question, and uh, the the problem is that there is uh, not not uh, there isn't anything as a perpetrator in this sense, uh, because these are these are in many cases uh, legislative procedures that are. Uh, far away from uh, a specific uh, actor, as in your case, uh, your suggestion is Russia. What we do see is that many of these legislative trends, but also the threats and the incidents that we see uh, concerning human rights and the internet, is something that is uh, spreading. So there's, uh, um, let's call it um, an environment where certain legislations are more uh, um, creative and also more uh, positive when it comes to spreading their, their knowledge into other jurisdictions. And the Russia is obviously one of them, where we, where we see a lot of uh, legislative systems that are similar to ones in, in Russia, for instance, spreading around the globe. But that's, uh, I would say that that's not really maybe a deliberate move from a specific actor. That's just how the way it is. I'll ask her in the question then. Um, so I think this was actually seen as a big win when, when the UNGA um, affirmed that uh, rights 
online should be the same as offline. And I actually think Sweden was, was quite, uh, played a key role there. Um, and as a principle, of course, that, that's one that, that's easy to agree with. Um, the challenge is then how do you um, how do you implement that in practice? And the big, well, there's been a lot of discussion about that in Sweden recently, and, and some proposals on how to deal with that. What are your thoughts on on, on that? Uh, well, I, I don't have too many thoughts on the Swedish situation. I see that it's not working in Sweden. Uh, but, but what we see is that obviously it is a challenge to make sure that human rights are, uh, uh, are protected online as well. The problem is that human rights are not always uh, protected offline, so obviously there is uh, a big task to ensure that human rights are protected anywhere. Uh, and I think that that is a, a problem currently. Uh, what we do see is that many of the people that have been involved in, in human rights uh, issues for many, many years suddenly also get involved in tech issues without being techies. And I think that is maybe the, the most interesting part currently, that there's uh, uh, quite a big gap between tech communities and human rights communities that I think needs to be uh, dealt with and uh, also uh, well handled in a progressive way in order to make sure that both this, this resolution could turn into, into effect but also to make sure that human rights are established as something that is worth protecting. Right, any other questions or comments? Yay! It's so dark in here, right? Didn't see you away. So being uh, one of the persons dragging you here, uh, Patrick Feldstrom, that note. If I understand things correctly, and, and I want to, to sort of correct me here um, if I'm wrong, but Human rights in reality is sort of agreements between states, what responsibilities they have to protect and treat their citizens, both in what they must do and what they're not allowed to do, right? So it has to do, so human rights in reality has to do with the relationship between the states and the citizens of, of their country. But people also talk about human rights um, when coming to what private companies do in relation with their customers. And I've been sort of fighting with trying to explain that that is sort of more into corporate social responsibility and what is right or wrong according to the norms in society. But a lot of people are using the terms human rights also on the acts that private companies do. Is that something that is a problem or is it the same thing? Doesn't matter what words we are using in terms. Is it a terminology issue? Should we care about that? Uh, obviously, it's, it's complicating as there are obviously more private uh, sector actors than, than countries and governments. So, of course, it's difficult to, to include um, such a broad community into this discussion. What is said, however, is that there are guiding, guiding principles from the UN how companies should act in accordance to human rights. And within that, there is also an obligation for companies to at least uh, refer to and also remedy those the human rights issues that could uh, be handled within their co cooperation or within the actions. You, you talk about the global compact thing, for example. Yes, also, yes, exactly. And also the rugged principles that are out there, which I think uh, that uh, could be interesting for more people to involve in. And even if, if you're not interested in, in reading uh, long UN documents, there obviously uh, corporate actors are involved in the activities in many of these issues. So even though you're, uh, a company might not be interested in dealing with human rights, uh, you will be in, in, some, in many of these cases as governments are putting pressure on uh, private sector actors to actually interfere with human rights. So therefore, even if, if you don't see uh, private sector actors as the typical human rights actor, uh, they will, they will be, uh, even if it's not by choice. Okay. Right. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Well, in that case, I'll say thank you very much.